In the last week of June 1916, for seven days and seven nights, the Allies bombarded the German defences along the Somme. Thousands of artillery guns fired shell after shell after shell. For seven days and seven nights. Such was the intensity of the shelling that in places it was said that the sun was blocked out by the smoke from the guns. For seven days and seven nights the guns fired. German supply lines were cut. All the German soldiers could do was retire deep underground into concrete bunkers and sit it out, thinking the next shell may be the one to bring tons of earth crashing down upon them. They ran out of decent drinking water and food, and some went stir-crazy. Those were the lucky ones, others were simply pulverised by the explosions. For seven days and seven nights it went on. Brandon lads witnessed this bombardment for themselves. They had joined up together in the early months of war and now, with many serving in the Norfolk Regiment, they would go over the top together. On the morning of the 1st of July 1916, these Brandon lads stood in the trenches, shoulder to shoulder, hearts racing, waiting for the whistles to signal the beginning of their attack on the decimated German lines. Then, just before they set off, they witnessed a huge mine explode under the Germans' feet. Taking the enemy and tons of earth up skyward and then crashing back down. Surely nothing could survive that. By the end of this first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British suffered almost 60,000 casualties and over 16,000 deaths. Six of them came from Brandon. It is still today the deadliest day in the history of the British military. As with any attack on the enemy lines, there were preparations to be carried out. The enemy may have been softened up by the artillery for a whole week, but on the evening of the 30th of June, hours before the attack, the barbed wire in no man's land had to be cut to allow passage for the troops to go through. This was not barbed wire as we may envisage today, say on a farm to keep cattle in, because on the Somme it was metres thick and impenetrable. A Brandon lad, Stanley Lingwood, was in a small party tasked with cutting the wire in the dark of night. He soon came under artillery fire from the enemy, which should have raised alarm bells that perhaps the German lines were not as weakened as everyone had hoped. In Stanley's words, he says, I went out with three men to clear the posts and loose wire from a gap we had cut in the barbed wire a night or so before. Just as we were returning, Fritz started to shell heavily the district through which we wanted to pass. We sought shelter for a few minutes and then found that the trench we wanted to go up was blocked with casualties. So we decided to go over the top. We were nearing the place we desired to get to when shelling again commenced. We naturally jumped down into the nearest trench, which at the spot I entered it contained quite two feet of muddy water into which I fell. So I will leave you to guess what sort of condition I was in for the rest of the night. That evening, another Brandon lad, William Lingwood, wrote home to his wife. No doubt you will know the reason in a few days' time if you watch the papers. I hope you won't worry over it, but this may be the last time I shall write to you, for you can never tell what might happen. But let us hope that we shall all get through safely. Remember me to all inquiring friends. I don't think the war will last much longer if this big move goes off all right. At least we all hope it will finish it. On the morning of the attack, a series of explosions rocked the battlefield. These were huge mines laid underneath the enemy by men tunnelling deep down under no man's land. 
They were, in their time, the biggest man-made explosions ever heard. Some even claim to have heard them 200 miles away in London. German soldiers caught in the blast were instantly vaporised. Stanley Lingwood, who had recovered from the previous night of cutting barbed wire, tells us of what he witnessed. We had an early breakfast and then moved off to our respective positions. At about 7.25am, word was passed down that in six minutes more, the first wave would go over. We glanced at our watches and presently felt the ground tremble, which we knew was caused by the explosion of our mine. Stanley was in a reserve trench, meaning his unit would not go over in the first wave, but instead would wait until he was called upon. He saw the initial attack unfold. The first wave having gone over, we then moved up to a nearer position in which we were told to remain and wait orders. Shells were bursting all around us and we received a liberal sprinkling of lumps of earth. But luckily none of the shells burst actually in the trench at the spot where we were. The following message soon came along. Everything moving splendidly, only six casualties in the first wave, Germans giving themselves up in hundreds. We may never know if this reflected truthfully the state of the battle. If the Germans were being easily defeated, then where was the artillery coming from that was landing around Stanley? Nonetheless, some sectors of the front line did see early gains for the British. However, in most areas, it became desperate. Cyril Burton was a Brandon lad whose father was a manager at one of the town's fur factories. Cyril's parents saved enough money to give him a decent education so he avoided following his parents' footsteps and working in Brandon factories. He passed his 11 plus and went on to Thetford Grammar School, then into King's College London and ultimately a career in the civil service in London. In spring 1915 he enlisted into the army and by the summer of 1916 he had made the rank of second lieutenant in the Sherwood Foresters. His mission on the first day of the Somme was to go over the top in the first wave, lead a few men down enemy trenches and lob grenades into dugouts where the enemy may be hiding. This went well and a number of dugouts were indeed blown up. Some German soldiers encountered along the way were dealt with too. Cyril led his men deeper into enemy territory. They came across a second line of trenches which had been obliterated by artillery shelling. Their objective was to get into a third line of trenches, far beyond the main thrust of the Allied advance. There was no alternative, they had to go across open ground and take shelter in shell holes as they went along. It was here they came under intense enemy gunfire. Cyril was struck in the thigh, cutting a main artery. As he bled out he crawled back to a shell hole while firing off rifle grenades. His comrades applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and it was reported Cyril was last seen making his own way back to seek medical assistance. He was never seen again. Another Brandon lad, Arthur Field, at the outbreak of war was one of the first to volunteer and see active service. In the summer of 1915 his unit was attacked by the Germans. He was actually very lucky to survive. An artillery shell exploded next to him, causing severe concussion with blood loss from his ears and his nose. Now, with the Devonshire Regiment, he too went over the top at the Somme. Initial resistance was light and prisoners were taken, but this did not last long. Stiffer resistance was met on their left flank, which crumbled and left them exposed to an attack. Communication lines were cut and officers were mowed down by machine guns, which led to confusion among the men. Despite this, the regiment reached their objective and even repelled a counter-attack. Sadly, Arthur was one of those killed. In other sectors, men walked in a broad line across no man's land. In front of them, it looked like rain was hitting the ground. This was, in fact, bullets from German machine guns. The lads went down like dominoes. As they did, the next line of men followed behind. Albert Carter, son of a Brandon Flintnapper, had been a career soldier for 11 years before his battalion, the 2nd Lincolnshires, moved up to the front line at half past three in the morning. His career had taken him to Gibraltar, Egypt and India, but nothing had prepared him for the Somme. 
When the whistles blew, he went over in the first wave. 90 minutes later, the attack was over and the Lynx had suffered 471 casualties. Albert was lying out there dead. Other Brandon lads, Francis Mutum, or Frank as he was known, and Fred Tolbert had joined up together at the start of war. They, along with dozens of other Brandon lads, also went over in the first wave with the Norfolk Regiment. Like Stanley Lingwood, they had witnessed a huge mine explode in front of them, but their viewpoint was different because they had crawled out about 30 yards into no man's land and were lying on their stomachs just waiting for the signal to advance. Within half an hour of those whistles sounding and the men going over into no man's land, the lads had reached the enemy trenches and seen for themselves the utter devastation caused by a week of incessant shelling. They pressed on and walked straight into the sights of the German machine gunners in the reserve trenches. By the end of the battle, 105 men were dead, 227 were wounded and 13 missing. Frank Mutum, Fred Talbot and William Lingwood, who had written home to his wife the evening before, were all dead. Stanley Lingwood survived. He did not go out in the first wave, but then he had done his part by going into no man's land to cut the barbed wire the evening before. He wrote home to his parents about what he saw in the aftermath of the battle. Although we expected every minute to receive the order over the top, that order never came along until things were typically quiet. When we did eventually go over, the scenes which confronted us were past description. To see dead and wounded of both friends and foe lying about in all directions and in all sorts of attitudes and conditions is truly one of those scenes which must be seen to be believed. It was the first time most of us had seen a modern battlefield just after an attack and we are not likely to forget it in a hurry. On the following Monday we were busily engaged in burying fatigue. It was anything but a nice job and as we were burying Germans I can assure you we did not give them many military honours. Our regiment distinguished itself by pressing a bit further forward, capturing a small wood and some German guns, which will be sent home to England as a permanent memento to the credit of the regiment. The vast superiority of our bombardment was very evident when we got over the other side. The ground in front of and between our lines was well sprinkled with shell holes. The ground on theirs was absolutely churned up, including exceptional holes 20 feet in diameter by 10 to 15 feet deep. In just a few hours, the British suffered almost 60,000 casualties on that first day on the Somme. A third of those were dead. Six Brandon lads were among those deaths. The Battle of the Somme did not finish that day. In fact, it carried on through into November, with the British attempting to break through and the Germans counter-attacking. By that time, six more Brandon men had been killed. Herbert Grass was killed on the 19th of July. Ernest Thompson on the 31st of July. Herbert Tilney on the 12th of August. Lawrence Cubitt, who had just been married just before he'd gone to the Somme, was killed on the 12th of October. Robert Docking was also killed in that same battle on the 12th of October. In 1916, Robert had experienced things that no 21-year-old should have. In March, he was on a reconnaissance mission with his commanding officer in no man's land when they came under artillery fire from the enemy. Both were wounded, but stayed put to complete their mission. For this, Robert was awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal and given leave to come home. Back in Brandon, he was rightly treated as the hero he was. During his time on the Somme, he was wounded and even helped to dig out another Brandon lad, Harry Ashley, who'd been buried under tons of earth by an artillery explosion. They say if your name is on a bullet, then there is nothing you can do about it. On October the 12th, the fate of Brandon's war hero was sealed when he went over the top and never returned. His body was never recovered. The last Brandon fatality on the Somme was that of James Dickerson on the 18th of October. Evidence suggests it is safe to assume at least 2 or 3% of Brandon's population fought on the Somme in 1916. Future research may even reveal it to be near a 5% or more. The newspapers kept the town updated with casualty lists. These are the names of Brandon lads 
I have discovered so far. Robert Arbour, who was wounded in a hand and lost part of a thumb. Harry Ashley suffered shell shock. Herbert Ashley of London Road was wounded in the neck and arm. Frederick Austin, whose mother lived on the high street, was hospitalised with his wounds. Herbert Field of Thetford Road was sent to Sheffield Infirmary with a severe wound to his thigh. Musket Field was hospitalised with a wound to his right arm. Walter Field of Berry Road spent time in a military hospital with shell shock. Percy Glaister of Town Street was sent to a hospital in Birmingham because his wounds were so severe he could not be treated in France. Bert Mutum of George Street received a face wound so severe he had to be brought back to Britain for specialist treatment in hospital in Birmingham. Bert's brother Walter Mutum was also hospitalised with a thigh wound at the same time. Fred Norton of Stores Lane was wounded in the neck. Edgar Randall was wounded on two separate occasions. Alfred Steggles, a Brandon postman who hailed from Dis, he was 37 years old when wounded on the Somme. He succumbed to his wounds and died, but he is not remembered on Brandon's war memorial. Mark Wilby was at a hospital in Littlehampton after he received wounds from the Somme. Also wounded were Harold Crocker of Ford Farm, Reg Norton of Town Street, Edmund Talbot of Berry Road, Herbert Tilney of London Road, Victor Wharf of Town Street, Ernest Witter, Percy Wicks and Mr A Wicks. It seems no one who served on the Somme came away unscathed, either physically or mentally. Arthur Secker, whose wife lived on London Road, was no sooner rescued after being buried from an artillery explosion when it happened a second time and he was buried again. This time he lay broken with back injuries in the dirt for an hour and a half before medics managed to get to him. Henry Wharf wrote to his parents in Gashouse Lane from his hospital bed in Ireland. His legs were smashed and he was unable to walk. It is like hell upon earth. The battle was worse where I was and I thought no man could have escaped without getting killed. I am sorry to say there were very few escaped where I was. I got buried with one shell and then unburied with another. It was a good job for me that they were both thick shells. If not, they would have blown me to atoms. At the time Henry wrote the letter, his brother Percy, who also served with the Brandon lads on the Somme, was also in a military hospital in Manchester. Even Stanley Lingwood was wounded. He received a wound to his hand so severe it meant he had to be returned to Britain for treatment. After a month of treatment, it was obvious to the military that he was of no longer use as a soldier. So in 1917, he was discharged from the army. He returned to Brandon and set up the town's first ever permanent cinema at the bottom of his family's garden, just by the Church Institute. The last word on the Somme goes to Standing Lingwood. It has been an experience which will never fade from the memory of any of us. Brandon still had two years of war to get through and worse was still to come. <laughs>